Dear gracious and loving Heavenly Father, I ask you, Lord, to take and open up your word. Help us to receive from the, your word what you'd have us to receive. Move mightily with us and with the study tonight. Bless us, O Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord. Amen. Now we are on to our second lesson in the seven seal dispensationalism study, where we are, we are progressing from the morning church into the period of time from 270 to 530. Now, 270 is the accepted time in which the Catholic Church was actually in its full form, but it hadn't been recognized by the state yet at this point. It wasn't until well, 320 that it actually got recognized as as the authority for the state, because the uh, Constantine hadn't bowed his knees to the Pope yet. But th uh, this would be what they classify as the Second Age. Where they get 530, I haven't the foggiest notion. They seem to be pulling it out. It must be one of the councils, but they seem to be pulling it out of thin air, in my opinion. But the, uh, the, the Second Church Age is supposed to take and range to, uh, to 580 A.D., so you're dealing with the, some of the most turbulent times in the beginning of the Catholic Church in which they were fighting over uh, Arianism, over uh, uh, Nestorianism, over several other heresies that they were in conflict over that they would end up settling at, at the, with the Nicene Creed in order to, to, to declare what the Trinity was. They were arguing over doctrine. They were, it was also dur uh, during this time period, they had already embraced numerous amounts of paganism at this point and were essentially a Christianized pagan religion is what they were. And that's part of where they, they were trying to mesh the two is part of the reason why the, there was so much conflict at this time. Would someone read Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11? And can you all see this? Yeah. Going white really helped. Yeah. Revelations 2, 8 through 11. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. So we see that the second church, the church of Smyrna, is one of the two churches of the seven that was an entirely pure wholesome, godly church. Jesus had nothing negative to say about them whatsoever. It was all, all positive. This is the church they're saying represents the, begin, the first stages of the Catholic Church. It makes no sense. It's seems totally insane to me where one of the two most uh, two holy churches is the one is the one they apply to the second church age now do the uh, the, the seventh seventh seal people are co catholic seventh sealers no but catholic uh, would have a problem with this being related to them probably would they mm. No, they wouldn't, because they would think it was pretty okay close. It, right? Yeah, but the seventh seal is is uniquely Church of God dispensationalism. Is it something denominational world in it too, like Baptist and Methodist? 
They believe in a premillennial dispensationalism, which is very similar to it. And they too believe this church represents the second church age. But not necessarily referring to the Catholics. No, they do believe it refers to the Catholics in the second church age. Mm -hmm. And they do believe that the Catholic church is a fallen church. But not at this point. Even at this point. So I can't refer to the Catholic church as a they believe that the second church age is an evil church age. So even this church that had that Christ has nothing bad to say about. Correct. The evil church. Yes. Now, okay. in the book on the subject that I was reading this past week. And it was written by a Church of God minister. He stated that the reason this church represents the, the, the cold pagan religions of, of, of Catholicism is because it's north of Ephesus. Well, yes. So it, it, it comes down to location. Yeah. Location, and then he applied the loss of your first love that was that they said about Ephesus to Smyrna, yeah. which doesn't fit. Okay, would someone read Revelations chapter or six verses three and four? Revelation six three and four. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon, to take peace from the earth, and they should kill that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Okay, so the, the second church age, according to this seal, is represented by a red horse with a sword that took peace away from society, and enable them to kill each other. Now, you cannot say this and this one for Smyrna or the uh, match up as the same church. When you say kill each other, who is who is the world, the earth, everybody? Everybody. Essentially, this where we have a sword that takes and brings salvation. This sword brings death, spiritual death. So it would have to be wicked, evil doctrines. Okay, would someone read Revelation 16, verse 3? Revelations 16, 3. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Yeah, I heard a lot of different theories on this particular vial. And how it would fit as the second church age, I don't, don't see. There are those that took, uh, in the Church of God that have taken applied this to the French Revolution because they took people out in boats and pulled pins and the bombs of the boats dropped out and killed, drowned them in the sea. But that would be taking it literally, not symbolically. Um, it's with spiritual symbolism and scriptural symbolism, water represents people. It do, it's so this has to be a mass of people that the vial takes and pours down on, and they become it becomes blood red, and every living soul died. So those who were saved c cease to be saved. probably because of the doctrine that was coming through with the red flow. But uh, I, we're talking one verse here. We're not talking a, a um, huge amount of context to work from. That's one of my problems with this, is that they don't use a lot of context. It's all diced up and, ch and chopped up and chewed up to fit their theory.
Now, if we take and fo uh, follow the interpretation, uh, all this has to take and line up. So the, bl uh, the vial pouring out into the sea, killing people, the red horse, and the Church of Smyrna all have to be the same thing. Now, I could see the red horse and this vial being the same thing. But how on earth do they tie a holy church to all this nonsense? Now, I grant you they're saying, well, well, well red horse isn't a holy church. Well, no, it isn't, but Smyrna is. The red horse is an evil religious organization. And if it's going to be countered against the white horse from the first seal, it's got to be a spiritual, a church, a, spirit, a religion. It has to be. Otherwise, the white horse wouldn't be a religion. So you're, so you're dealing with religions here. And this one specifically just doesn't fit. The early apostate church how uh, would include with this uh, theory two of the of the pure the two pure churches in the uh, different stages of the apostasy. Get back to interpretate, interpretate where they would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we would have two of the pure churches in the middle of the apostasy, and. When the light comes back out, we would have evil churches. There's something wrong with this. Let's go and read Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses one through four. Second Thessalonians two, one through four. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that of the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, and the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, and that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. So both of these scriptures are direct references to the upcoming apostate church. Both of them are. Now, you could argue they come from different time periods because it wasn't until after 1000 AD that the, uh, that the Catholic Church banned marriage among the priesthood and started introducing that you had to eat fish on Friday. But either way you look at it, the Pope was established by 270. The, re uh, the reason why they, the conflict ended was because when they took and, and were arguing in the council, a guy stood up and said, well, the Pope says this, and they said, okay, then it's settled. That, that's literally how the, their argument over the Trinity ended. So the Pope was already established by this point in time in history, and yet... We look at it, and what what were they? They were they were fallen away. They had fallen away before this point in time. 
So if they've fallen away before this point in time, they've, they've surrendered to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, then they cannot be the church of Smyrna. I can think of some others they could be, but they can't be the church of Smyrna. And they always lay it out as Ephesus is the first church age, Smyrna is the second church age, Pergamus is the next, and so on and so forth, to where, you, it, to where it falls in chronological line. So they don't mix them up. And it really would make a whole lot more sense if they mixed them up. I kind of, and, and this is just my thought, because I don't know anything, but I always thought that they were kind of all at the same time. Well, I, they were. They all were existing at the same time. It can't be that this was, I mean, that there's a row of them. Well, well, they believe they were representative of different ages. I see. It wasn't an actual age. Yeah. So, so, so when you t come down to the, or the F Ephesian age would be the first dispensation in millennialism, dispensational millennialism, or the first church age in the seventh seal doctrine. So when were these ages actually? Well, they're saying that the first one was from the time of coming of Christ until 270 A.D., the second one was 270 A.D. to 530 A.D. The other one, the next one, takes up at 530 A.D. and goes on from there. I don't know, have the date in my head, and so forth until you get to the sixth seal, which starts in 1880. Then it lasts 50 years and then it ceases because as the church goes apostate and the seventh seal opens and there's silence. Spoken in the 80s. Till the 80s. Till the 80s. Yeah. So, uh, so anybody who was born, uh, who was saved before uh, 1980, that just... Too bad. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then what were you saved to then if there was no truth was above? That's what I've always wondered. Because I have never met a preacher that taught this doctrine that wasn't saved before 1980. Until recently, Addison I, I wasn't wasn't saved before right. 1980, and he's the only preacher I've seen preaching this doctrine that is young that young. So, well, in their uh, belief in this seventh seal stuff, is that? help them explain revelation is that why they, they do it i mean i mean it gives them an alternate view of revelations yes but it enables them to write themselves into revelations it kind of makes more sense to them if they do it this way sort of i mean it, i mean well I'm trying to figure out why they would want to believe this if they if they've heard the other explanation you know hm riggles you know what you taught before about revelation if they've heard that they have just rejected that and want to believe this well uh, some of them not all of them but some of them believe that regal took in and smith mm -hmm. both took and apostatized and were preaching demonic doctrines before they he, he passed so well, and that question goes to well why did the Baptists believe what they believe and why did the Methodists believe what they believe and so hmm. it, you know, now if you want my opinion and this is strictly my opinion on the subject I believe arrogance is why they do it if they're inserting themselves in it that's what it sounds like because they go through and say that okay the glorious reformation that D.S. Warner led that's the sixth seal. But, we, uh, but it apostatized, and we are the final seal. We're greater than Warner. Well, they obviously haven't read the seventh seal because it wasn't all that great. <laughs> it was the most brutal of all the seals. <laughs> and it was devastation. 
each of the progressive seal of vials, when they open, you have pestilences growing into a more excessive rate. But the same is true with the seals. The first seal it shows the church. The second seal shows the red horse. The next one shows the black one. The next, the next one shows a pale green one. Then the next, uh, and then, then it just gets really bad from there. You have it opening up and locusts coming at, uh, from out of hell oh, in, in the form of smoke, and you've got uh, um, fire-breathing creatures coming out of the Euphrates. I mean. And um, we're, we are uh, chimera type creatures that were symbolizing something specific and those symbols have a relevance, but not if you're not taking them as a, a religious body. If you're taking them as individuals, now suddenly it has a totally different meaning and it changes everything. Because if the four witnesses bound in the river Euphrates are actually Smith, Regal, oh, Naylor, and Byram, and that they're, they're the, the um, creatures coming out breathing brimstone to, uh, d with, uh, with snake tails and uh, where their death comes from both ends. It's, uh, they're there to destroy and to, to conquer and to who, um, kill. That does not sound like those four individuals to me. Stand on the understanding of Keep saying they. Who are they? Those that teach the seventh seal doctrine. They are breakoffs of the Church of God. Um, the gospel trumpet group that Danny Lane started, they teach it. Uh, God's Acres in Newark, Ohio, they teach it. What? <laughs> Spinogle in Alabama teaches it. And there's about six or, uh, five or six more groups that teach it. Um, we had some that believed it firmly in the church in, in North Carolina that I pastored. Um, so I've been dealing with people who believe this doctrine for a long time. And there's and one of the one of the one of the most influential evangelists in the state of Tennessee preaches this doctrine for the church of God. And he's associated with Anderson, which blows my mind because this thing teaches that Anderson is totally apostate. He may be dead now. It has been a while. But neither of these could ever be represented as a pure church. It just would be totally impossible for them to take and pass themselves off as a pure church. The red horse kills with a sword. Now we associate the sword with the word of God. So if he has a word for his God that kills instead of brings to life, then it's got to be his doctrine, right? That's just logical that you symbols don't normally mix up. So if the, uh, the church would go forth with a, a sword out of it, well, if Christ would come with a sword out of his mouth, then, and that is bringing life, then this one, which brings death, is the opposite. So it, so it would be a demonic doctrine. Would someone read 1 Timothy ch chapter 5, verse 6? 1 Timothy 5, 6. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And then Romans 6, 20 through 23. Romans 6, 20 to 23. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. 
But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end of everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, the Bible teaches that sin is death. If you're in sin, you're spiritually dead. Now, if this sword kills, then it causes people to sin. It's a doctrine that causes people to sin. Just that simple. The color matters. People ignore it. Others will take and go off on a tangent about it. Uh, some are even get it right. But the color does matter. The horse is red. The dragon is red. At one point in time, the beast is red. The, uh, the great whore, Babylon, is dressed in red. So when we, uh, we take a look at it, what is the common denominator? Paganism. Because the dragon represents pagan Rome, and it's the first symbol that makes its appearance with, uh, with the color red. Even in Daniel, well, the, when Rome was per portrayed, it is a red beast. So, and it makes sense that it would be a red dragon anyway, because the, uh, the imperial standard of Rome is a red dragon. So, and I counted its horns, and it does have ten horns, by the way. Actually, um, this was written after that, and, and the and they probably never read Daniel, but. Um, <laughs> but uh, but as you as you take and even the sea turns to the color of blood, and it kills people. Once more, you've got the 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 doctrines that destroy. Now I grant you that in this case, it was an angel that poured the vial out, but an angel just means messenger. So we have distinct ties to the system of paganism and those and paganism's doctrines kill. That's true to even this day. If you look around us, there are a lot of pagan doctrines in our society. And they are still killing people even to this day spiritually. Now, there are people that are coming out of it getting saved, but there's a lot that aren't. And there are those that go away out of Christianity and go into that because they reject the truth because the paganism seems so much more spiritual. I've heard them say that. Some people are attracted to the ceremony, the ritualism. Paganism is full of ritual and ceremony. And it doesn't matter which kind of paganism you take and look at, they all have their rituals. Even witches. Even witches. They all have to ha have their... Well, to quote a scholar that I read numerous years ago, to have magic be magic, you have to have your ceremony your invocational prayer, and then the occurrence of the, of the supernatural activity. It has to follow that pattern. Otherwise, nobody would know that it, uh, what it was. While miracles... Forget you can forget the ceremony. You have the, uh, but they say we still do it, though. Think about it. When we anoint people to, and pray for them, we're doing a ceremony and an invocational prayer and expect a result. That's why so many people equate magic and miracles together. 
The difference is, is that magic is performed by demons. Miracles are performed by God. But God's miracles don't require the ceremony. Did they always take and, and anoint with, uh, follow a ceremony when healing people? No. John and, and Peter took and were walking to the gate. Beautiful. Silver and gold have I none. What I uh, have I given to thee? Take up thy bed and walk. They took his hand and picked him up. And he was healed. They walked down through the streets. The apostles did. Their shadows crossed people. They were healed. Naughty and no prayer involved. Um, they prayed over napkins and sent them out. And people were healed. So... There's no set, uh, cut and dried ritual in Christianity. It's one of the reasons why the um, pagans used to think Christians were atheists. But then on the other hand, the oil is specific. Yeah. And they were told. They were told to use the oil, yes. The oil, anoint, pray. Yes, the Bible does teach that we are to take an anoint with oil and pray over them by laying hands on them. But if you don't have the oil, God doesn't well, withhold blessing just mm -hmm. because you don't have the oil. When we were in Ohio, because I asked, I asked Dad, where did you get that? Because it would be convenient. He had a solid piece of something that he threw. And he anointed Lee. And uh, I said, where did you get that? Well, it wasn't. It wasn't oil, olive oil. It was, I don't know, some kind of house packers. Yeah, I don't remember what he told me it was, but I went, oh, well, well I don't know that it's. I mean, that's what they had, too. Back well, okay. Olive oil is common. Right. You know, coconut oil is solid at room temperature. That is true. And it's also a uh, tropical area that mm. you use what you get. You use what you've got. Right. I um, think it. It's the oil. Yeah, I've I've anointed people with mineral oil. Yeah. Um, olive oil. But, uh, I don't think I've ever done that, but I could. Yeah. Let's just work right over cars. <laughs> or no. Or, <laughs> I was doing racist several previews. The drug removal thing. Yeah. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> But, but, um, but oil does symbolize the Holy Ghost. But the uh, the thing is, is that when you uh, some people are are drawn to the fact that those who believe in paganism expect results, and therefore. When they if they get the results, so people take and put credit in them as ha, as have you know, both builds their belief and makes them to where they take and are more firmly attached to these. Well, I know a gentleman that that he takes and puts a double-edged axe and a stump outside his place. Whenever there's a storm coming, so that the axe can split the storm. Yeah, it works every time. Well, that's what he says. It works every time. <laughs> that's my opinion. I don't think it has a thing to do with it, but um, but it's a superstition, and paganism is based on superstition. It was something his granddad taught him, and so he's still carrying it out because he believes in it. He says he doesn't, he's not even sure that it works, but he knows that, it, that they've never been hit with a storm as long as he's done it. We'd like to not make a disbelieve that because we don't want the storm. <laughs> well, okay. I pray for the storm, uh, pray about the storms when they come in so that God's protection is over the whole camp. Because I don't want anybody killed out there or massive damages. We want people to take and I'd like to see them honor God is what I'd like to see. So the church 
the seal, the vial, clearly do not represent the same subjects. I would say they represent radically different subjects. So if they represent different subjects, they cannot be the same church ages. And they don't fit the nature of the church age they're claiming they fit. Oh, okay, the red horse and the the vial oh, might come close to the age in which they they were portrayed, but they truly don't fit the age they portray. But we don't believe in what they what we call church ages. No, I do not believe in church ages. It's more of a. There's only been one true church throughout. Hmm. You just established it. Correct. Always been here, always been around, no matter what's going on. If anything, you could say that there is a one church age. It's the gospel age. And even what gets me is the um, millennialists will go through and they'll talk about the gospel age, which they believe ends when and the millennium starts. Christ comes back. The gospel age is over. Then he conquers the world, reestablishes sacrifices at the temple, and... Basically undoes everything he did before. <laughs> Very counterproductive. You're, you're, you're moving backwards. Yes. So when we actually look at what happens in the in the scriptures, yes, the, they did progress to wickedness. We know that happened when. Uh, when it says that who would uh, that it'll be held back until that who which is let it is removed. John's one of the last ones that let. He was one of the last ones standing in the way. After him, yes, the next generation still had preachers that held to the truth, but as it progressively moved away from their time frame of the apostles, they became more and more apostate until they fell into total apostasy. Then the church was only in small enclaves, and they were having to hide from both the so-called church and from the, the pagans as well. Because they were still holding to the truth. God has always had a people throughout all time. Amen. Any questions, comments? Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I ask you, Lord, to bless us, O Lord, and be with us as we travel back to our homes. Move mightily with us, O Lord, and help us to be your witnesses in everything we do. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord. Amen.